Good morning. Well, as Bruce said, I'm Danny Martin. I'm one of the leaders here at City on a Hill Church. It's great to see all of you here today, and great to be seen by all of you watching online, whether you are live with us or watching on YouTube later. Thanks for watching. In the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, God spoke to a man named Avram. We say Abram in English. And God told Abram that he would send him from his home and bless him with countless descendants. One small problem, though, Abram and his wife Sarai had no kids. And as one of my seminary professors used to say, they were light years beyond childbearing age. Way too old to start having kids. But this is God we're talking about. And he had a bold promise for Abram and Sarai in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Turn with me there in your Bible or Bible app, if you will. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. While you're turning there, I will remind you that God wants to know you. And he wants you to seek him. One of the best ways to seek him is through regular reading of his revealed words in the Bible. Though I'm pleased to read it to you today, I hope you're reading it regularly by yourself, with your family, and with your church family. Bible reading is one of the most important, essential rhythms for our spiritual growth. It has meaning for your life today. Genesis 12, starting in 1, I've got NIV, follow along in whatever you have. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that anyone can be a descendant of Abraham, that anyone can be adopted into your family through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you that we are blessed so that we, we may be a blessing and that we are, we are a part of your plan to bless all people on earth. Help us to seek to be a blessing to those around us every single day. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So God called Abram and later renamed him Abraham and told him the whole world would be blessed through him. But Abraham's story isn't just a story of God deciding to be extra nice to one guy with no end goal in mind. It was instead a foundational moment in God's ultimate mission of rescuing humanity from sin and separation and restoring a path to relationship between God and human beings. God chose Abraham and his descendants to have a unique role in this mission, but he also chose Abraham and his descendants to have a unique responsibility. In other words, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. God loved Abraham's family, the people of Israel, but he also loved everybody else. God wanted to use Abraham's family, Israel, to show the world who he was. That's the capital P purpose of the nation of Israel. God called Israel a nation of priests. A priest is someone who shows God to others, like an intermediary. Israel was meant to be a nation of people that shows God to others. So we read in Exodus 19, starting in 6, where God says, and, and you, and that's plural, all y'all, and all y'all, will be my kingdom, thank you for laughing, will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message that you, Moses, 
must give to the people of Israel. God said this to the entire nation of Israel, not just to the priests who were in Israel, because he intended Israel to be a whole nation of priests, a whole culture whose purpose was to show God to the whole world. Because, like Abraham, Israel was not only selected by God to be blessed, but to be a blessing. And by the time Jesus came on the scene, it's been a very long time since Abraham. Many of Abraham's blood descendants have stopped trusting God like Abraham did. They've stopped living as if they have been blessed to be a blessing. And instead, they have become protective of their heritage and of the token power that the Roman Empire let them have. So when John the Baptist is preaching out in the wilderness early in Jesus' ministry, he says this to many of the Jewish religious leaders in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. And as we read in our responsive scripture and prayer time from Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul would later teach that Abraham's descendants weren't only those blood relatives that God provided long ago. Everybody who puts their trust in Jesus Christ shares in the same blessing that Abraham received and is called an adopted child of God. God can raise up descendants of Abraham from two people light years beyond childbearing age. He can raise them up from stones. He can raise them up through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank God that is precisely what he has done. So if Abraham was blessed to be a blessing, and if Abraham's descendants are blessed to be a blessing, and if Christians today are Abraham's descendants through faith in Jesus, then we have been blessed to be a blessing. Like Abraham, we have not merely been granted a unique privilege, but also a unique responsibility. We have been elected to salvation so that we can perform whatever services God calls us to. So we read in Ephesians chapter 2, starting at 8, most of us have probably heard this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? So that we can do the things he planned for us long ago. The pinnacle of that ancient promise to Abraham is that everyone who trusts God like Abraham did, in a manner of speaking, becomes his descendant by proxy. Abraham's blood descendants were called a kingdom of priests. They were meant to show God to the world. Anybody want to guess what Christians are called? The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2. For you, church... Are a chosen people. You, church, are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you, church, can show others the goodness of God, for he called you, church, out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Jesus had told his followers in Matthew 28 what we call the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. If you are a Christian and you are hearing my voice right now, you have been blessed to be a blessing. Saved by grace through faith to do good work set before you, 
You are a royal priest, a citizen of a holy nation. You have been given a great commission by Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit has empowered you with spiritual gifts to accomplish this mission. If only we could say amen right there and be done with the sermon. If you've been following Jesus for a while, you've probably noticed that just because we are all called to make disciples and teach them to obey Jesus' commands does not mean that we are all equally good at doing this. There are a lot of different spiritual gifts. One of them is evangelism. You've met Christians gifted in evangelism. They are so annoying. They can somehow take any conversation about anything and turn it toward Jesus. They can, they can say stuff like, you're having a hard day. You know who else had a hard day? Jesus. And they get away with it. They have this God-given superpower of nudging people outside of their comfort zones, while at the same time being completely and honestly genuine about it. You'd think it would be awkward. It's not awkward when they do it. When I do it, it's like my IQ drops into the caveman range. I have a friend, his name Jesus. He want me tell you come church every Sunday. It's not actually that bad, but it feels like it. A problem for the past few generations of American Christians is that the American church exploded in growth after World War II. And God used radio, TV, the new interstate system, and air travel to send gifted evangelists to every living room and every corner of this nation. Billy Graham, for example, and many others like him. Scores of Christians either absorbed the idea or were outright taught that these evangelist methods of getting the good news of Jesus out had to be everybody's method. So if I say to you in 2023 that we all need to evangelize, what you hear me saying is, after church today, we all need to go to St. Paul and hand out religious pamphlets to strangers on the street. Or you hear me saying that you need to walk up and down your street, knock on everybody's door, and force a religious conversation on your neighbors. If this annoys your neighbors, it has to be because they hate God. It can't possibly be that you're an uninvited guest forcing them to talk about something they don't want to talk about on their day off. There absolutely are people who are called and equipped by God to do this sort of ministry. They should. We need people doing street ministry, knocking on doors, or striking up potentially uncomfortable conversations with strangers in public. I lived in Utah for several years and did ministry there. There's a group of guys who go out every Thursday night, and they go and they stand outside the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, and they are really good at having difficult religious conversations with strangers on the street. What these guys are doing is important, and it is by God's grace drawing lost people to Jesus. I am not against that method of making disciples. There will always be a need for it, there will always be people that God calls and equips to do it well. What I'm cautious of is the idea that this is the only way to make disciples of Jesus. Because if we believe that that's the only way to make disciples, very few of us will ever make disciples. We will assume, as two and a half generations of American Christians have, that making disciples is for Bible experts, superhero evangelists, celebrity preachers, and overseas missionaries. We will give money to support these people. We will show up at these people's events, but we ourselves will never engage in discipleship. But Jesus' great commission and the task of disciple-making are for all of us. That's why we're talking about the bless practices.
the blessed practices are for the vast majority of us who feel a burden for our non-Christian friends, neighbors, and coworkers, and loved ones, but who don't want to take up a part-time job as a door-to-door religious salesman. The blessed practices were developed by a couple of Christian leaders who are deeply concerned about the shrinking of the American church and who want to empower everyday Christians to live out Jesus' great commission. So the authors of a book about the blessed practices ask, what if you could change the world without changing your daily routine? Jesus' mission for all of us can seem impossible because church leaders haven't prepared their churches for how simple it can and should be. We can bless simply by thinking and acting a little bit differently about, we all, about what we already do in our day-to-day lives. We can build trust with those around us by deciding to be a blessing through the blessed practices. We can thoughtfully show people the goodness of God. There are five blessed practices. Each letter in the word bless corresponds with one. B is for begin with prayer. L is for listen well. E is for eat together, my personal favorite. The first S is for serve in love. The second S is for share your story. Begin with prayer, listen well, eat together, serve in love, share your story, bless. Two weeks ago, we talked about beginning with prayer, the letter B. Pastor Bruce encouraged us to look into a resource called the Bless Every Home app that can be downloaded on a smartphone. The purpose of this app is very simple. It shows you who lives near you and reminds you to pray for them. That's it. The blessed practice B asks us to focus on a person or place we know and to begin with prayer. Beginning with prayer is crucial because it's about trajectory adjustment. We start from the correct beginning point so we get to the correct end point. It's easy to go about our everyday without praying for all the places and people that we interact with. Instead of just seeing that neighbor, that coworker, that barista, or whoever it is that we see regularly, we can begin praying for the places we frequent and the people who are there. Or in those places we, f- we frequent, we can begin praying for God to create opportunities for us to build relationships with people. Begin praying for God the Holy Spirit to open your spiritual eyes and ears to what is going on around you versus being entirely focused on what you want or need from a place or a person. Begin with prayer so you can start seeing how God wants to use you for people in his great rescue mission. Beginning with prayer is not about becoming a superhero evangelist. It's about saying yes every day to Jesus' great commission and to God the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. So that was the letter B in a nutshell that we talked about two weeks ago. This week, we'll talk about the letters L and E, listening well and eating together, and how we can learn to use these things in our lives to accomplish God's rescue mission. So, to bless others, Jesus invites us to listen to them. I mentioned that Sarah and I lived in northern Utah for several years. I have a special expertise in Mormon studies, and I was working there with a ministry that trains pastors, church planners, missionaries, people like this, to effectively reach the population there. At the same time, I felt personally burdened that as a professional Christian, 
I had almost no natural ways of building relationships with people who weren't already Christian. Not to mention that the LDS church or the Mormon church keeps its people really busy, making it even more difficult to build relationships with them if they were your neighbors, which in Utah they are. So to find a way to listen to people who didn't already follow Jesus, I had to find a way to get a foot in the door with people. My solution was to join several local writers groups, which I attended between one and three days a week every week. Slowly over time, I got to know a core group of people in these writers groups, built relationships, workshopped a lot of bad writing, built trust. Within a year and a half, you had a guy with the training of a pastor, but at the time not the title, being asked to speak in front of a room full of Mormons, as well as as super-duper liberal artists, professors, and generally secular people. And while I wasn't asked to speak to them because of my faith in Jesus, that faith guides everything I do and naturally influences how I interact with people and what I say about everything. Over time, people opened up and gave me opportunities to listen well to them. If I'd come in on day one going up to the group's leaders like, I'm a pastor and I want to teach communication skills to your writer's groups and this is America, so buckle up so I'm going to say whatever I want, how I want to say it. It's pretty unlikely they ever would have let me speak to their writer's group. So I was able to build friendships with a lot of people who would probably never voluntarily walk into a Christian church as well, as well as with several Mormons, including one middle-aged mom of six, who later asked me to edit one of her books, which was an act of great trust, not only in my skills, but in me personally and our relationship. I don't know how, I'd have, how I would have ever met her without seeking out a place of shared interest. Any shared activity or hobby gives us a chance to meet people we otherwise wouldn't. They don't live near us, they don't work with us, but they like the same stuff as us. I know, it takes a special kind of dork to look at two grown men hitting each other with wooden swords and say, I would also like to do that. But you know, they're my kind of special dorks. And that's the point. We connect over shared interests regardless of core beliefs, and this allows each of us to be a blessing in all the different settings that God might send us as a church body. Some of you, because of your experiences, background, schooling, work, whatever, will connect better with certain types of folks than Bruce or I ever will. We live in a noisy world. We all have to intentionally seek opportunities to listen well. For me, in that season, I had to do a lot of groundwork to listen well. Some of you might not have to do so much groundwork. You might already have opportunities to listen well because you're surrounded by people who need Jesus at work, school, or elsewhere, and you have a relationship with them. The challenge for you will be to intentionally listen to not be so distracted by the noise of the world that you cease to hear those God has placed in your life for you to bless. Jesus once had to block out the noise to listen to someone who needed him. Jesus and his disciples were traveling through the city of Jericho, and there were people crowding around Jesus, peppering him with questions. It was outside, so probably like goats and chickens running all over the place, getting in the mix. And in the midst of all of this, we read in Mark chapter 10, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. He essentially says, I'm listening. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The late philosopher and Christian writer Dallas Willard said, the first act of love is always the giving of attention. Even though it seems obvious that a blind guy would want to see, Jesus still asked him a question and listened to his answer. Jesus spent a lot more time asking other people questions than directly answering questions that he was asked. Cut through the noise in the world and in your life. As a way of life, we all must decide to listen well. And speaking of our noisy world, commercials. How's that for a smooth transition? Is there any more quintessentially American art form than the commercial? And the purest form of the commercial, I'm convinced, was consumed from the early 1990s up to the 2000s. You remember some of them. Got milk? Well, do you? Because if you don't, you've got to get some. I suspect they never sold more milk than during that campaign. Is your hair on fire? Bank account drained through credit card fraud? Did you sit in wet paint in your business suit? It'll be fine just as soon as you pop. A Mentos, the fresh maker. And of course, we can't forget beef. It's what's for dinner. When Sam Elliott tells you beef is what's for dinner, beef is for dinner, cupcake. And down in Florida, we had one from a regional fast food restaurant chain. It simply went, you got to eat. Who do you think you are? You won't get far. You got to eat. A truer statement was never made. <laughs> You've got to eat. There's no scenario where everybody who doesn't want to live doesn't want to eat. And because we've all got to eat, Eating together is one of the simplest ways to build relationships with and bless other people. So, to bless others, Jesus invites us to eat with them. Jesus ate with people all the time. When Jesus called Matthew the tax collector to be his disciple, one of the first things he did was invite Matthew to a dinner party at his own house <laughs> So we read in Matthew 9, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In Luke's gospel alone, there are 10 stories that include Jesus eating with people. Jesus, Jesus ate with people so much that his critics accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. There's that Jesus again. He's eating and drinking, eating and drinking, eating and drinking. This guy's not full yet. And in the early Christian church, Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us that the first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer a regular practice of their community building included regularly eating together. In almost every culture, eating together is a way of demonstrating and building relationships with others. Even social scientists have recognized this. If you sit at a table with other people and everybody takes their food from the same plate or bowl, like a family-style dinner, everyone at the table will develop trust for one another more quickly than if they brought their own food. 
and way more quickly than if nobody eats. This is why Jesus ate with people who were considered undesirable and why people assumed that because he was eating with undesirable people that he was participating with them in sin. Eating with people both develops and communicates closeness. But Jesus didn't eat with people to be influenced. He did it to be an influencer. Jesus demonstrated vulnerability and trust by allowing himself to be served food. And he allowed others to express trust and vulnerability by participating. It's a two-way street. The famous TV chef, Gordon Ramsay, when he's not screaming at people, can be quite insightful. He said that there is no more intimate act than giving a person something that they are going to put inside of their body. If someone gives you something to eat, there is a pretty high level of trust there because it is not hard to make somebody sick with food. If somebody gives you something to eat and it makes you sick, you're probably not going to take something from them again. The American chef, Thomas Keller, said that he knew he wanted to become a chef when he realized that fundamentally being a chef is about nourishing people. That's what eating together is about. That's why we trust one another more quickly when we eat together, and it's why inviting people to eat with you can easily create opportunities for you to do the other blessed practices like listening, serving, and sharing your story. Eating together is about creating an environment of trust. Rosaria Butterfield correctly tells us that hospitality is the ground zero of the Christian faith. I mentioned earlier that one of the challenges of working as a professional Christian is that we lose a lot of that day-to-day interaction with people. And when we do have them, it's always a coin toss when people find out what we do for work. Sometimes they're cordial, other times they find a way to moonwalk out of there. They escape. So we have to be creative and intentional as Christian leaders if we're trying to find ways to bless others. One of the ways that I have personally, or one organization that I've personally worked with serves local international students. It's called the Hospitality Center. International students come from all over the world to study in the United States. They're new to our country, unfamiliar with our language and customs, isolated from family and friends, and often very eager to meet Americans because they want to learn. They're looking for relationship. So by volunteering at the Hospitality Center's Friendship Maps program, I had the opportunity last year to meet regularly with a grad student from Mumbai, India, who'd never been to the U.S. before. He asked me a lot of questions about living here. I was able to tell him that, yes, it is not only okay, but advisable in the U.S. to make a right-hand turn on a red light. Not all heroes wear capes. (laughs) And we were even able to have him and his girlfriend from Taiwan over to our house just a few months ago for dinner. These are people who I never would have had an opportunity to meet without deciding to be an intentional, to be intentional and seeking opportunities to begin with prayer, listen, and eat together. As international students in downtown Minneapolis, they certainly wouldn't have found their way down to Burnsville, let alone to our little church here in Rosemount. Anybody can contact the Hospitality Center today and they will gladly provide you opportunities to meet with international students in Minneapolis or St. Paul who want an American friend they can call if they need advice about living here. You don't need to learn another language. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to be available for a person who is saying they want a friend and maybe know that it's okay to make a right on a red. Wouldn't it be cool if every able family at City on a Hill 
developed a friendship with an, with an international student? Wouldn't it be cool if we independently pursued those relationships, independently blessed them by taking them out to coffee or lunch once or twice a month, or had them over to eat? And wouldn't it be cool if we got all of them together here in December and hosted a big Christmas party for them and let all these young adults from every nation, tribe, and tongue see what Christmas looks like when the people celebrating it really believe who Jesus, that Jesus is who he said he is? It would be really cool if all of us who decided to use the very convenient QR code to go to the Hospitality Center website <laughs> and see what opportunities are available. If we're willing to spend $5,000 to go to a foreign country for a week on a short-term mission trip, we should also be willing to invite a young adult from another country out to coffee or into our home for a meal. Many of these students will return to their home countries after their studies. This gives us a tremendous opportunity to bless those who will return to the foreign fields where they can be a blessing to their own people. So, we're blessed to be a blessing, to bless, to bless others, listen, to bless others, eat with them. And finally, you don't have to make it grow for God to bless your relationship with someone. For two generations or so of American Christians, we've had this idea that we either need to be pounding the pavement personally, converting people, or we need to always be inviting people to our church or to a revival meeting or to some thing, some event, some big to-do. And that's how we will obey Jesus' great commission. While there is nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, I have found that lurking in the backs of a lot of people's minds is this idea that it is up to us to make people's faith grow. The Apostle Paul dealt with this issue in his first letter to the Christian church in Corinth. People were arguing about who their favorite Bible teacher was. And Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 3. After all, who is Apollos, which was another leader? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. Paul planted, Apollos watered, God made it grow. It is not our job to make people grow. It is not your job to make someone believe Jesus is the risen Son of God. It is the Holy Spirit's job. It is the Bible's job. Our job is to plant and water. God might simply use you to show a doubting per person that he is real and he loves them. God might simply use you to introduce them to that person who might be more useful at answering tough questions you can't answer. Maybe God is simply calling us to shake trees so others can pick up fruit. Jesus' half-brother James, Mary and Joseph's biological son, didn't believe he was the Messiah. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus' brothers mocked him. Jesus didn't try to force his own brothers to grow when it wasn't time for them to grow. Yet we know from the letter of James in our Bibles that James did come to faith in Jesus as his Savior. And James became a pillar in the early church. And when James died, he died because he refused to deny that Jesus is Lord. Jesus didn't close the deal with a lot of people. He did lots of groundwork with people. 
He did lots of groundwork with his own brothers. He performed signs. He spoke truth. And when an honest person approached him saying, what do I have to do? He told them. Even when Jesus was on the scene, some people came around later. Our job is to be a city on a hill. We show people what it means to live Jesus' way. We show them what it means to have hope. We show what it means to love like Jesus loves. We speak and live out the God's honest truth, and we trust him to do the rest as we seek every day to bless as we have been blessed.